Act One, Scene One, A Public Place. Enter Samson and Gregory, armed with swords and bucklers. Gregory, on my word, will not carry coals. No, for then we should be coalers. I mean, and we be in collar, we'll draw. Ay, while you live, draw your neck out of the collar. I strike quickly, being moved. But thou art not quickly moved to strike. A dog of the house of Montague moves me. To move is to stir, and to be valiant is to stand. Therefore, if thou art moved, thou runst away. A dog of that house shall move me to stand. I will take the wall of any man or maid of Montague's. That shows thee a weak slave, for the weakest goes to the wall. True, and therefore women, being the weaker vessels, are ever thrust to the wall. Therefore I will push Montague's men from the wall, and thrust his maids to the wall. The quarrel is between our masters, and us their men. Tis all one. I will show myself a tyrant. When I have fought with the men, I will be cruel with the maids. I will cut off their heads. The heads of the maids? Ay, the heads of the maids, or their maiden heads. Take it in what sense thou wilt. They must take it in sense that feel it. Me they shall feel while I am able to stand. And tis known I am a pretty piece of flesh. Tis well thou art not fish. If thou hadst, thou hadst been poor John. Draw thy tool. Here comes two of the house of Montagues. My naked weapon is out. Quarrel, I will back thee. How? Turn thy back and run? Fear me not. No, Mary, I fear thee. Let us take the law of our sides. Let them begin. I will frown as I pass by, and let them take it as they list. Nay, as they dare. I will bite my thumb at them which is disgrace to them if they bear it. Enter Abraham and Balthazar. Do you bite your thumb at us, sir? I do bite my thumb, sir. Do you bite your thumb at us, sir? Is the law of our side if I say I? No. No, sir, I do not bite my thumb at you, sir. But I bite my thumb, sir. Do you quarrel, sir? Quarrel, sir? No, sir. But if you do, sir, am for you. I serve as good a man as you. No better. Well, sir. Say better. Here comes one of my master's kinsmen. Yes, better, sir. You lie. Draw, if you be men. Gregory, remember thy swashing blow. They fight. Enter Benvolio. Part, fools. Put up your swords. You know not what you do. Beats down their swords. Enter Tybalt. What? Art thou drawn among these heartless hinds? Turn thee, Benvolio. Look upon thy death. I do but keep the peace. Put up thy sword, or manage it to part these men with me. What? Drawn and talk of peace? I hate the word, as I hate hell, all Montagues, and thee. Have at thee, coward. They fight. Enter several of both houses, who join the fray. Then enter citizens with clubs. Clubs, bills and partisans, strike, beat them down, down with the Capulets, down with the Montagues. Enter Capulet in his gown, and Lady Capulet. What noise is this? Give me my long sword, oh. A crutch, a crutch, why call you for a sword? My sword, I say. Old Montague is come, and flourishes his blade in spite of me. Enter Montague and his lady Montague. Thou villain, Capulet, hold me not, let me go. Thou shalt not stir one foot to seek a foe. Enter Prince with attendants. Rebellious subjects, enemies to peace, profaners of this neighbour stained steel. Will they not hear? What ho, you men, you beasts, that quench the fire of your pernicious rage? with purple fountains issuing from your veins, on pain of torture from those bloody hands. Throw your mistempered weapons to the ground, and hear the sentence of your moved prince. Three civil brawls, bred of an airy word, by thee, old Capulet, 
and Montague, have thrice disturbed the quiet of our streets, and made Verona's ancient citizens cast by their grave beseeming ornaments to wield old partisans in hands as old, cankered with peace, to part your cankered hate. If you ever disturb our streets again, your lives shall pay the forfeit of the peace. For this time, all the rest depart away. You, Capulet, shall go along with me. And Montague, come you this afternoon, to know our farther pleasure in this case, to old Freetown, our common judgment place. Once more, on pain of death, all men depart. Exeunt, Prince and Attendants, Capulet, Lady Capulet, Tybalt, Citizens, and Servants. Who set this ancient quarrel new abroach? Speak, nephew, were you by when it began? Here were the servants of your adversary and yours, close fighting ere I did approach. I drew to part them. In the instant came the fiery Tybalt, with his sword prepared, which... As he breathed defiance to my ears, he swung about his head and cut the winds who, nothing hurt withal, hissed him in scorn. While we were interchanging thrusts and blows, came more and more and fought on part and part, till the prince came, who parted either part. Oh, where is Romeo? Saw you him today? Right glad I am he was not at this fray. Madam... An hour before the worshipped sun peered forth the golden window of the east, a troubled mind drave me to walk abroad, where, underneath the grove of sycamore that westward rooteth from the city's side, so early walking did I see your son. Towards him I made, but he was ware of me and stole into the covert of the wood. I measuring his affections by my own, that are most busied when they're most alone, pursued my humour, not pursuing his, and gladly shunned who gladly fled from me. Many a morning hath he there been seen, with tears augmenting the fresh morning's dew, adding to clouds more clouds with his deep sighs. But all so soon as the all-cheering sun Should in the farthest east begin to draw The shady curtains from Aurora's bed, Away from light steals home my heavy sun, And private in his chamber pens himself, Shuts up his windows, locks fair daylight out, And makes himself an artificial night. Black and portentous must this humour prove, Unless good counsel, May the cause remove. My noble uncle, do you know the cause? I neither know it, nor can learn of him. Have you importuned him by any means? Both by myself and many other friends. But he, his own affection's counsellor, is to himself, I will not say how true, but to himself so secret and so close, so far from sounding and discovery, as is the bud bit with an envious worm, ere he can spread his sweet leaves to the air, or dedicate his beauty to the sun. Could we but learn from whence his sorrows grow, we would as willingly give cure as no. See where he comes! So please you, step aside. I'll know his grievance, or be much denied. I would thou wert so happy by thy stay to hear true shrift. Come, madam, let's away. Excellent Montague and lady. Enter Romeo. Good morrow, cousin. Is the day so young? But new struck nine. Ay, me. Sad hours seem long. Was that my father that went hence so fast? It was. What sadness lengthens Romeo's hours? Not having that which, having, makes them short. In love? Out. Of love? Out of her favour, where I am in love. Alas, that love so gentle in his view should be so tyrannous and rough in proof. Alas, that love whose view is muffled still should without eyes see pathways to his will. Where shall we dine? Oh, me, what fray was here! Yet tell me not, for I have heard it all. Here's much to do with hate, but more with love. Why then, O oh, brawling love, O oh, loving hate? 
O oh, anything of nothing first create! O oh, heavy lightness, serious vanity, misshapen chaos of well-seeming forms, feather of lead, bright smoke, cold fire, sick health, still waking sleep, that is not what it is. This love feel I that feel no love in this. Dost thou not laugh? No, cause I rather weep. Good heart at what? At thy good heart's oppression. Why, such is love's transgression. Griefs of mine own lie heavy in my breast, which thou wilt propagate to have it pressed with more of thine. This love that thou hast shown doth add more grief to too much of mine own. Love is a smoke raised with a fume of sighs, being purged, a fire sparkling in lovers' eyes, being vexed, a sea nourished with lovers' tears. What is it else? A madness most discreet, a choking gall and a preserving sweet. Farewell, my coz. Going. Soft. I will go along. And if you leave me so, you do me wrong. Tut. I have lost myself. I am not here. This is not Romeo. He is some other where. Tell me, in sadness, who is that you love? What? Shall I groan and tell thee? Groan? Why, no, but sadly tell me who. Bid a sick man in sadness make his will. Ah, word ill urged to one that is so ill. In sadness, cousin, I do love a woman. I aimed so near when I supposed you loved. A right good markman, and she's fair, I love. A right fair mark, fair cuz, is soonest hit. Well, in that hit you miss, she'll not be hit with Cupid's arrow. She hath Diane's wit, and in strong proof of chastity well armed, from love's weak childish bow she lives unharmed. She will not stay the siege of loving terms, nor bide the encounter of assailing eyes, nor ope her lap to saint seducing gold. Oh, she's rich in beauty, only poor, that when she dies, with beauty dies her store. Then she hath sworn that she will still live chaste? She hath, and in that sparing makes huge waste for beauty, starved with her severity, cuts beauty off from all posterity. She's too fair, too wise, wisely too fair, to merit bliss by making me despair. She hath forsworn to love, and in that vow do I live dead that live to tell it now. Be ruled by me. Forget to think of her. Oh, teach me how I should forget to think. By giving liberty unto thine eyes, examine other beauties. Tis the way to call hers exquisite in question more. These happy masks that kiss fair ladies' brows, being black, puts us in mind they hide the fair. He that is struck and blind cannot forget the precious treasure of his eyesight lost. Show me a mistress that is passing fair. What doth her beauty serve but as a note where I may read who passed that passing fair? Farewell. Thou canst not teach me to forget. I'll pay that doctrine, or else die in debt. Excellent. Scene two. A street. Enter Capulet, Paris, and servant. But Montague is bound as well as I, in penalty alike. And tis not hard, I think, for men so old as we to keep the peace. Of honourable reckoning are you both. And pity tis you lived at odds so long. But now, my lord, what say you to my suit? But saying all what I have said before. My child is yet a stranger in the world. She hath not seen the change of fourteen years. Let two more summers wither in their pride. There we may think her right to be a bride. Younger than she are happy mothers made. And too soon marred are those so early made. The earth hath swallowed all my hopes but she. 
She is the hopeful lady of my earth. But woo her, gentle Paris, get her heart. My will to her consent is but a part, and she agree, within her scope of choice, lies my consent, and fair according voice. This night I hold an old accustomed feast, whereto I have invited many a guest, such as I love. And you among the store, one more, most welcome, makes my number more. At my poor house, look to behold this night, earth-treading stars that make dark heaven light, such comfort as do lusty young men feel when well-apparelled April on the heel of limping winter treads. Even such delight among fresh female buds shall you this night inherit at my house. Here all, all see, and like her most, whose merit most shall be. Which, among view of many, mine, being one, may stand in number, oh, in reckoning none. Come, go with me. Go, Sarah, trudge about through fair Verona. Find those persons out whose names are written there. Gives a paper. And to them say, My house and welcome on their pleasure stay. Exit Capulet and Paris. Find them out whose names are written here. It is written that the shoemaker should meddle with his yard, and the tailor with his last, the fisher with his pencil, and the painter with his nets. But I am sent to find those persons whose names are here writ, and can never find what names the writing person hath here writ. I must to the learned in good time. Enter Benvolio and Romeo. Tut, man! One fire burns out another's burning. One pain is lessened by another's anguish. Turn giddy and be hope by backward turning. One desperate grief cures with another's languish. Take thou some new infection to thy eye, and the rank poison of the old will die. Your plantain leaf is excellent for that. For what, I pray thee? For your broken shin. Why, Romeo, art thou mad? Not mad, but bound more than a madman is, shut up in prison, kept without my food, whipped and tormented, and... God den, good fellow. God gear good den. I pray, sir, can you read? Aye, mine own fortune in my misery. Perhaps you have learned it without book. But, I pray, can you read anything you see? Aye, if I know the letters and the language. Ye say honestly, rest ye merry. Stay, fellow. I can read. Reads. Signor Martino and his wife and daughters. County Anselmo and his beauteous sisters. The lady widow of Vitruvio. Signor Placencio and his lovely nieces. Mercutio and his brother Valentine. My uncle Capulet, his wife and daughters, my fair niece Rosaline, Livia, Signor Valencio, and his cousin Tybalt, Lucio, and the lively Helena, a fair assembly. Gives back the paper. Whither should they come? Up. Whither? To supper. To our house. Whose house? My master's. Indeed. I should have asked you that before. Now I'll tell you without asking. My master is the great rich Capulet. And if you be not of the house of Montagues, I pray, come and crush a cup of wine. Rest you merry. Exit. As this same ancient feast of Capulets sups the fair Rosaline whom thou so lovest, with all the admired beauties of Verona, go thither, and with unattainted eye compare her face with some that I shall show, and I will make thee think thy swan a crow. When the devout religion of mine eye maintains such falsehood, then turn tears to fires. And these, who often drowned, could never die, transparent heretics be burnt for liars. One fairer than my love, the all-seeing sun, ne'er saw her match since first the world begun. 
Tut, you saw her fair, none else being by, herself poised with herself in either eye. But in that crystal scales, let there be weighed your lady's love against some other maid, that I will show you shining at this feast, and she shall scant show well that now shows best. I'll go along, no such sight to be shown, but to rejoice in splendour of my own. Exit. Scene three, room in Capulet's house. Enter Lady Capulet and Nurse. Nurse, where's my daughter? Call her forth to me. Now by my maidenhead, at twelve year old, I bade her come. What lamb? What ladybird? God forbid! Where's this girl? What Juliet? Enter Juliet. How now? Who calls? Your mother. Madam, I am here. What is your will? This is the matter. Nurse, give leave a while. We must talk in secret. Nurse, come back again. I have remembered me. Thou's here our counsel. Thou knowest my daughter's of a pretty age. Faith, I can tell her age unto an hour. She's not fourteen. I'll lay fourteen of my teeth. And yet, to my teen it be spoken, I have but four. She is not fourteen. How long is it now to Lammastide? A fortnight, and odd days. Even or odd of all days in the year, come Lammas Eve at night, she shall be fourteen. Susan and she, God rest all Christian souls, were of an age. Well, Susan is with God. She was too good for me. But as I said, on Lammas Eve at night, shall she be fourteen. That she may marry, I remember it well. Tis since the earthquake now eleven years, and she was weaned. I never shall forget it, of all the days of the year upon that day, for I had then laid wormwood to my dug, sitting in the sun under the dove-house wall. My lord and you were then at Mantua. Nay, I do bear a brain, but as I said, when it did taste the wormwood on the nipple of my dug and felt it bitter, pretty fool, to see it tetchy, and fall out with the dug. Shake, quoth the dove-house, t'was no need, I trow, to bid me trudge. And since that time it is eleven years, for then she could stand alone. Nay, by the rood, she could have run and waddled all about. For even the day before she broke her brow, and then my husband, God be with his soul, a was a merry man, took up the child, Yea, quoth he, dost thou fall upon thy face? Thou wilt fall backward when thou hast more wit, wilt thou not, Jewel? And by my holy dame, the pretty wretch left crying, and said, I, to see now how a jest shall come about, I warrant, and I should live a thousand years, I never should forget it. Wilt thou not, Jewel, quoth he, and pretty fool it stinted and said i enough of this i pray thee hold thy peace yes madam yet i cannot choose but laugh to think it should leave crying and say i and yet i warrant it had upon its brow a bump as big as a young cockerel stone a perilous knock and it cried bitterly yea quoth my husband falst upon thy face Thou wilt fall backward when thou comest to age, wilt thou not, Jewel? It stinted and said, I. And stint thou too, I pray thee, nurse, say I. Peace, I have done. Thou wast the prettiest babe that e'er I nursed, and I might live to see thee married once I have my wish. Marry, that marry is the very theme I came to talk of. Tell me, daughter Juliet. How stands your disposition to be married? It is an honour that I dream not of. An honour! Were not I thine only nurse, I would say thou hadst sucked wisdom from thy teat. Well, think of marriage now. Younger than you, here in Verona, ladies of esteem, are made already mothers. By my count I was your mother much upon these years that you are now a maid. Thus, then, in brief, the valiant Paris seeks you for his love. A man, young lady, 
lady, such a man as all the world. Why, he's a man of wax. Verona's summer hath not such a flower. Nay, he's a flower, in faith a very flower. What say you? Can you love the gentleman? This night you shall behold him at our feast. Read o'er the volume of young Paris's face, And find delight writ there with beauty's pen. Examine every married lineament, And see how one another lends content, And what obscured in this fair volume lies, Find written in the margent of his eyes. This precious book of love, this unbound lover, To beautify him only lacks a cover. The fish lives in the sea, and tis much pride For fair without the fair within to hide. That book in many's eyes doth share the glory, That in gold clasps locks in the golden story. So shall you share all that he doth possess, By having him making yourself no less. No less, nay bigger, women grow by men. Speak briefly, can you like of Paris's love? I'll look to like, if looking liking move. But no more deep will I indart mine eye Than your consent gives strength to make it fly. Enter a servant. Madam, the guests are come, supper served up. You called, my young lady asked for, The nurse cursed in the pantry, And everything in extremity. I must hence to wait. I beseech you follow straight. We follow thee. Exit servant. Juliet, the county stays. Go, girl. Seek happy nights to happy days. Exit. Scene four. A street. Enter Romeo, Mercutio, Benvolio, with five or six maskers, torchbearers, and others. What? Shall this speech be spoke for our excuse, or shall we on without apology? The date is out of such prolixity. We'll have no Cupid hoodwinked with a scarf, Bearing a Tartar's painted bow of lath, Scaring the ladies like a crow-keeper, Nor no without-book prologue Faintly spoke after the prompter for our entrance. But let them measure us by what they will, We'll measure them a measure, and be gone. Give me a torch. I'm not for this ambling. Being but heavy, I will bear the light. Nay, gentle Romeo, we must have you dance. Not I, believe me, you have dancing shoes with nimble soles. I have a soul of lead, so stakes me to the ground I cannot move. You are a lover. Borrow Cupid's wings, and soar with them above a common bound. I am too sore and pierced with his shaft to soar with his light feathers, and so bound I cannot bound a pitch above dull woe. Under love's heavy burden do I sink. And to sink it in, should you burden love? Too great oppression for a tender thing. Is love a tender thing? It is too rough, too rude, too boisterous, and it pricks like thorn. If love be rough with you, be rough with love. Prick love for pricking and you beat love down. Give me a case to put my visage in. Putting on a mask. A visored for a visored. What care I what curious eye doth quote deformities? Here are the beetle brows shall blush for me. Come, knock and enter, and no sooner in, but every man betake him to his legs. A torch for me. Let wantons, light of heart, tickle the senseless rushes with their heels, for I am proverbed with a grandsire phrase. I'll be a candle-holder and look on. The game was ne'er so fair, and I am done. Tuff, done's the mouse, the constable's own word. If thou art done, we'll draw thee from the mire of this, Sir Reverend's love wherein thou stick'st up to the ears. Come, we burn daylight, ho. Oh. Nay, that's not so. I mean, sir, in delay we waste our lights in vain, like lamps by day. Take our good meaning, for our judgment sits five times in that, ere once in our five wits. And we mean well in going to this mask, but tis no wit to go. Why, may one ask? I dreamt a dream to-night. 
And so did I. Well, what was yours? That dreamers often lie. In bed asleep, while they do dream things true. Oh, then I see Queen Mab hath been with you. She is the fairy's midwife, and she comes in shape no bigger than an agate stone on the forefinger of an alderman, drawn with a team of little atomies athwart men's noses as they lie asleep. Her wagon spokes made of long spinner's legs, the cover of the wings of grasshoppers, the traces of the smallest spider's web, the collars of the moonshine's watery beams, her whip of cricket's bone, the lash of film, her wagoner, a small grey-coated net, not half so big as a round little worm pricked from the lazy finger of a maid. Her chariot is an empty hazelnut, made by the joiner squirrel or old grub, time out of mind, the fairy's coachmakers. And in this state she gallops, night by night, through lovers' brains, and then they dream of love, or courtiers' knees that dream on curtsies straight. Or lawyers' fingers, who straight dream on fees. Or ladies' lips, who straight on kisses dream. Which oft the angry mab with blisters plagues, Because their breaths with sweetmeats tainted are. Sometime she gallops o'er a courtier's nose, And then dreams he of smelling out a suit. And sometimes comes she with a tithe-pig's tail, Tickling a parson's nose as he lies asleep, Then dreams he of another benefice. Sometime he driveth o'er a soldier's neck, And then dreams he of cutting foreign throats, Of breeches, ambuscados, Spanish blades, Of healths five fathom deep. And then, anon, drums in his ear, At which he starts and wakes, and, being thus frightened, swears a prayer or two, and sleeps again. This is that very mab that plats the manes of horses in the night, and bakes the elf-locks in foul sluttish hairs, which, once untangled, much misfortune bodes. This is the hag, when maids lie on their backs, that presses them, and learns them first to bear, making them women of good courage. This is she. Peace, peace, Mercutio, peace. Thou talkst of nothing. True. I talk of dreams, which are the children of an idle brain, begot of nothing but vain fantasy, which is as thin of substance as the air and more inconstant than the wind, who woos even now the frozen bosom of the north, and, being angered, puffs away from thence, turning his face to the dew-dropping south. This wind you talk of blows us from ourselves. Supper is done, and we shall come too late. I fear too early, for my mind misgives some consequence, yet... Hanging in the stars shall bitterly begin his fearful date with this night's revels and expire the term of a despised life closed in my breast by some vile forfeit of untimely death. But he that hath a steerage of my course, direct my sail. On, lusty gentlemen. Strike drum. Exit. Scene five. A hall in Capulet's house. Musicians waiting. Enter servants. Where's Potpan? That he helps not to take away. He shift a trencher. He scrape a trencher. When good manners shall lie all in one or two men's hands. And they unwashed too. Tis a foul thing. Away with the join stools. Remove the court cupboard. Look to the plate. Good thou, save me a piece of march pane. And as thou loves me. Let the porter let in Susan Grindstone and Nell. Antony in Potpan. Ay, boy, ready. You are looked for and called for, asked for and sought for in the great chamber. We cannot be here and there too. 
Cheerily, boys, be brisk a while, and the longer liver take all. They retire behind. Enter Capulet and company, with the guests, the maskers. Welcome, gentlemen. Ladies that have their toes unplagued with corns will have a bout with you. Ah, my mistresses! Which of you all will now deny to dance? She that makes dainty, she, I'll swear, hath corns. Am I come near you now? Welcome, gentlemen! I have seen the day that I have worn a vizard, and could tell a whispering tale in a fair lady's ear, such as would please. Mm, tis gone, tis gone, tis gone. You are welcome, gentlemen. Come, musicians, play. The hall, all give room and foot it, girls. Music plays, and they dance. More light, you knaves, and turn the tables up, and quench the fire. The room is grown too hot. Ah, Sarah, this unlooked-for sport comes well. Nay, sit, nay, sit, good cousin Capulet, for you and I are past our dancing days. How long is now since last yourself and I were in a mask? By your lady, thirty years. What, man, tis not so much, tis not so much. "'Tis since the nuptial of Lucentio. "'Come Pentecost as quickly as it will, some five and twenty years, and then we masked. "'Tis more, tis more. His son is elder, sir. His son is thirty. "'Will you tell me that? His son was but a ward two years ago.' "'What lady is that?' Which doth enrich the hand of yonder knight? I know not, sir. Oh, she doth teach the torches to burn bright. It seems she hangs upon the cheek of night Like a rich jewel in an Ethiop's ear. Beauty too rich for use, for earth too dear. So shows a snowy dove Trooping with crows as yonder lady O'er her fellows shows. The measure done, I'll watch her place of stand, And touching hers make blessed my rude hand. Did my heart love till now? Forswear its sight, For I ne'er saw true beauty till this night. This, by his voice, should be a Montague. Fetch me my rapier, boy. What, dares the slave come hither? Covered with an antic face to fleer and scorn at our solemnity? Now, by the stock and honour of my kin, To strike him dead I hold it not a sin. Why, how now, kinsman? Wherefore storm you so? Uncle, this is a Montague, our foe, A villain that is hither come in spite To scorn at our solemnity this night. Young Romeo, is it? Tis he, that villain. Romeo. Content thee, gentle cars, let him alone. He bears him like a portly gentleman. And to say truth, Verona brags of him to be a virtuous and well-governed youth. I would not for the wealth of all the town here in my house do him disparagement. Therefore be patient, take no note of him. It is my will, the which, if thou respect, show a fair presence. And put off these frowns, an ill-beseeming semblance for a feast. It fits, when such a villain is a guest, I'll not endure him. He shall be endured. What, good man, boy? I say he shall. Go to. Am I the master here, or you? Go to. You'll not endure him. God shall mend my soul. You'll make a mutiny among my guests. You will set cock a hoop, you'll be the man. Why, uncle, tis a shame. Go to, go to, you are a saucy boy. Is't so indeed? This trick may chance to scathe you. I know what, you must contrary me. Marry, tis time. Well said, my hearts. You are a princox, go, be quiet, or... More light, more light. For shame, I'll make you quiet. What? 
cheerily, my hearts. Patience perforce with willful collar meeting makes my flesh tremble in their different greeting. I will withdraw. But this intrusion shall, now seeming sweet, convert to bitter gall. Exit. To Juliet. If I profane with my unworthiest hand this holy shrine, the gentle fine is this. My lips, two blushing pilgrims ready stand to smooth that rough touch with a tender kiss. Good pilgrim, you do wrong your hand too much which mannerly devotion shows in this. For saints have hands that pilgrims' hands do touch, and palm to palm is holy palmer's kiss. Have not saints' lips and holy palmers too? Ay, pilgrim, lips that they must use in prayer. Oh, then, dear saint, let lips do what hands do. They pray, grant thou, lest faith turn to despair. Saints do not move, though grant for prayer's sake. Then move not while my prayer's effect I take. Thus from my lips by thine my sin is purged. Kissing her. Then have my lips the sin that they have took. Sin from my lips? O oh, trespass sweetly urged. Give me my sin again. You kiss by the book. Madam, your mother craves a word with you. What is her mother? Mary Bachelor, her mother is the lady of the house, and a good lady, and a wise and virtuous. I nursed her daughter that you talked with all. I tell you, he that can lay hold of her shall have the chinks. Is she a Capulet? Oh, dear account, my life is my foe's debt. Away, be gone, the sport is at the best. Ay, so I fear. The more is my unrest. Nay, gentlemen, prepare not to be gone. We have a trifling foolish banquet towards. Is Dean so? Why, then, I thank you all. I thank you, honest gentlemen. Good night. More torches here. Come on, then. Let's to bed. Ah, Sarah. To second, Capulet. By my fay, it waxes late. I'll to my rest. Exit. All but Juliet and Nurse. Come hither, Nurse. What is yon gentleman? The son and heir of old Tiberio. What's he that now is going out of door? Mary, that, I think, be young Petruchio. What's he that follows there, that would not dance? I know not. Go ask his name. If he be married, my grave is like to be my wedding-bed. His name is Romeo, and Montague, the only son of your great enemy. My only love sprung from my only hate, too early seen unknown, and known too late. Prodigious birth of love it is to me that I must love a loathed enemy. What's this? What's this? A rhyme I learned even now, of one I danced withal. One calls within. Juliet. Anon, anon, come, let's away. The strangers are all gone. Exit. Enter chorus. Now old desire doth in his deathbed lie, and young affection gapes to be his heir. That fair for which love groaned for it would die, with tender Juliet matched, is now not fair. Now Romeo is beloved and loves again alike bewitched by the charm of looks. But to his foe supposed he must complain, and she steal love's sweet bait from fearful hooks. Being held a foe he may not have excess to breathe such vows as lovers used to swear, and she as much in love her means much less to meet her new beloved anywhere. But passion lends them power time means to meet, Tempering extremities with extreme sweet. Exit. End of Act One